the National Sunday Law, the argument of A.T. Jones before the U.S. Senate Committee, December 1888, Part 1. Senator Blair, there are gentlemen present who wish to be heard in opposition to the bill. Professor Alonzo T. Jones of Battle Creek College, Michigan, is one of those who have spoken to me in regard to it. Will you not state, Professor Jones, what your desire is? I have no doubt that we can obtain leave of the Senate to sit during its session today. It is exceedingly desirable to go on with this hearing and complete it now. How would such an arrangement comport with your convenience? First, state, please, whom you represent and your reasons for desiring to be heard. Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, I represent the people known as Seventh-day Adventists. It is true, we have been entirely ignored by the other side, the very small sect, as they stated it, of Seventh-day Baptists, has been recognized. But we are more than three times their number, and many times their power in the real force of our work. We have organizations in every state and territory in the Union. We have the largest printing house in Michigan, the largest printing house on the Pacific Coast, the largest sanitarium in the world, a college in California and one in Michigan, and an academy in Massachusetts, a printing establishment in Basel, Switzerland, one in Christentina, Norway, and one in Melbourne, Australia. Our mission work has enlarged until, besides embracing the greater part of Europe, it has also extended nearly all around the world, and we desire a hearing with the consent of the committee. Senator Blair, where do you reside? Mr. Jones, at present in Michigan. My home for the past four years has been in California. I am now teaching history in Battle Creek College, Michigan. I must say in justice to myself, and also in behalf of the body which I represent, that we dissent almost wholly, I might say wholly, from the position taken by the representative of the Seventh-day Baptists. I knew the instant that Dr. Lewis stated what he did here, that he had given his case away. We have not given our case away, Senators, nor do we expect to give it away. We expect to go deeper than any have gone at this hearing, both upon the principles and upon the facts, as well as upon the logic of the facts. Senator Blair, this matter is all familiar to you. You are a professor of history. Can you not go on this afternoon? Mr. Jones, yes, if I can have a little space between now and this afternoon to get my papers together, I have some references to read that I did not bring with me this morning. Senator Blair, very well. Argument. Senator Blair, you have a full hour, Professor. It is now half past one. Mr. Jones, there are three particular lines in which I wish to conduct the argument. First, the principles upon which we stand. Second, the historical view. And third, the practical aspect of the question. The principle upon which we stand is that civil government is civil and has nothing to do in the matter of legislation with religious observances in any way. The basis of this is found in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 22, verse 21. When the Pharisees asked whether it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not, he replied, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. In this, the Savior certainly separated that which pertains to Caesar from that which pertains to God. We are not to render to Caesar that which pertains to God. We are not to render to God by Caesar that which is God's. Senator Blair, may not the thing due to Caesar be due to God also? Mr. Jones, no, sir. If that be so, then the Savior did entangle himself in his talk, the very thing which he wanted him to do. The record says that they sought 
how they might entangle him in his talk. Having drawn the distinction which he has between that which belongs to Caesar and that which belongs to God, if it be true that the same things belong to both, then he did entangle himself in his talk. And where is the force in his words, which command us to render to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and to God the things that are God's? Senator Blair. Is it not a requirement of God's that we render to Caesar that which is due to Caesar? Mr. Jones, yes. Senator Blair, if Caesar is society and the Sabbath is required for the good of society, does not God require us to establish the Sabbath for the good of society? And if society makes a law accordingly, is it not binding? Mr. Jones, it is for the good of society that men shall be Christians, but it is not in the province of the state to make Christians. For the state to undertake to do so would not be for the benefit of society. It never has been. It never can be. Senator Blair, do you not confuse this matter? A thing may be required for the good of society, and for that very reason, be in accordance with the will and the command of God. God issues his commands for the good of society, does he not? God does not give us commands that have no relation to the good of society. Mr. Jones, his commands are for the good of man, Senator Blair. Man is society. It is made up of individual men, Mr. Jones. But in that which God has issued to man for the good of men, he has given those things which pertain solely to man's relationship to his God. And he has also given things which pertain to man's relationship to his fellow men. With those things in which our duty pertains to our fellow men, civil government can have something to do. Senator Blair, man would obey God in obeying civil society. Mr. Jones, I will come to that point. In the things which pertain to our duty to God, with the individual right of serving God as one's conscience dictates, society has nothing to do. But in the formation of civil society, there are certain rights surrendered to the society by the individual without which society could not be organized. Senator Blair, that is not conceded. When was this doctrine of a compact in society made? It is the philosophy of an infidel, Mr. Jones. It is made wherever you find men together, Senator Blair. Did you and I ever agree to it? Did it bind us before we were complementous? Mr. Jones, certainly. Civil government is an ordinance of God, Senator Blair. Then is it not necessarily an agreement of man, Mr. Jones? Yes, sir, it springs from the people, Senator Blair. As to the compact in society that is talked about, it is not conceded that it is a matter of personal an individual agreement. Society exists altogether independent of the volition of those who enter into it. However, I shall not interrupt you further. I only did this because of our private conversation in which I thought you labored under a fallacy in your fundamental proposition that would lead all the way through your argument. I suggested that ground, and that is all. Mr. Jones. I think the statement of the Declaration of Independence is true, that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Senator Blair, I do not controvert that. Mr. Jones, of all men in the world, Americans ought to be the last to deny the social compact theory of civil government on board the Mayflower, before the Pilgrim Fathers ever set foot on these shores, the following was written, In the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith, and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, 
do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland the 18th and of Scotland the 54th Anno Dominini, 1620. Close quote. The next American record is that of the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, 1638-1639, and reads as follows, quote, For as much it hath pleased the Almighty God, by the wise dispensation of his due prudence, so to order and dispose of things that we, the inhabitants and residents of Windsor and Hartford and Westerfield, are now cohabiting and dwelling in and upon the river of Connecticut and the lands thereunto adjoining and well knowing where a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such a people, there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God to order and dispose of the affairs of the people at all seasons as occasion shall require. Do therefore associate and con convene ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth, and do for ourselves and our successors, and such as shall adjoin to us at any time hereafter, enter into combination and confederation together, etc. Close quote. And, sir, the first constitution of your own state, 1784, in its Bill of Rights, declares, quote, number one, all men are born equally free and independent, therefore, all government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent, and instituted for the general good. Number three, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others, and without such an equivalent, the surrender is void. Number four, among the natural rights, some are in their very nature unalienable, because no equivalent can be received for them. Of this kind are the rights of conscience. Close quote. And in part two of that same constitution, under the division of the form of government are these words, quote, The people inhabiting the territory formerly called the province of New Hampshire do hereby solemnly and mutually agree with each other to form themselves into a free, sovereign, and independent body, politic, or state by the name of the state of New Hampshire, close quote. In the Constitution of New Hampshire of 1792, these articles are repeated word for word. They remain there without alteration in a single letter under the ratification of 1852 and also under the ratification of 1877. Consequently, sir, the very state which sends you to this capital is founded upon the very theory which you here deny. This is the doctrine of the Declaration of Independence. It is the doctrine of the Scriptures, and therefore we hold it to be eternally true. These sound and genuine American principles, civil governments deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed and the inalienability of the rights of conscience, these are the principles asserted and maintained 
by Seventh-day Adventists, Senator Blair. But society is behind the government which society creates. Mr. Jones, certainly. All civil government springs from the people. I care not in what form it is. Senator Blair, that is all agreed to. Mr. Jones, but the people, I care not how many there are, have no right to invade your relationship to God nor mine. That rests between the individual and God through faith in Jesus Christ, and as the Savior has made this distinction between that which pertains to Caesar and that which is God's, when Caesar exacts of men that which pertains to God, then Caesar is out of his place. And in so far as Caesar is obeyed there, God is denied. When Caesar, civil government, enacts of men that which is God's, he demands what does not belong to him. And in so doing, Caesar usurps the place and the prerogative of God, and every man who regards God or his own rights before God will disregard all such interference on the part of Caesar. This argument is confirmed by the Apostles' commentary upon Christ's words. In Romans 13, 1 through 9, is written, quote, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Close quote. It is easy to see that this scripture is but an exposition of Christ's words, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. In the Savior's command to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, there is plainly a recognition of the rightfulness of civil government, and that civil government has claims upon us which we are in duty bound to recognize and that there are things which duty requires us to render to the civil government. This scripture in Romans 13 simply states the same thing. In other words, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Again, the Savior's words were in answer to a question concerning tribute. They said to him, Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Romans thirteen six refers to the same thing, saying, For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. In answer to the question of the Pharisees about the tribute, Christ said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. 
Romans 13, 7, taking up the same thought, says, Render, therefore, to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. These references make positive that which we have stated, that this portion of Scripture, Romans 13, 1 through 9, is a divine commentary upon the words of Christ in Matthew 22, verses 17 to 21. The passage refers first to civil government, the higher powers, the powers that be. Next, it speaks of rulers as bearing the sword and attending upon matters of tribute. Then it commands to render tribute to whom tribute is due, and says, O no man anything, but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Then he refers to the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth commandments, and says, If there by any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There are other commandments of this same law to which Paul refers. There are the four commandments of the first table of the law, the commandment which says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then there is the other commandment, in which are briefly comprehending all these, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Paul knew full well these commandments. Why then did he say, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, because he was writing concerning the principles set forth by the Savior, which relate to our duties to civil government. Our duties under civil government pertain solely to the government and to our fellow men, because the powers of civil government pertain solely to men in their relation one to another and to the government. But the Savior's words in the same connection entirely separated that which pertains to God from that which pertains to civil government. The things which pertain to God are not to be rendered to civil government, to the powers that be. Therefore, Paul, although knowing full well that there were other commandments, said, if there be any other commandment, It is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is, if there be any other commandment which comes into the relation between man and civil government, it is comprehended in this saying that he shall love his neighbor as himself, thus showing conclusively that the powers that be, though ordained of God, are so ordained simply in things pertaining to the relation of man with his fellow men and in those things alone. Further, as in this divine record of the duties that men owe to the powers that be, there is no reference whatever to the first table of the law. It therefore follows that the powers that be, although ordained of God, have nothing whatever to do with the relations which men bear toward God. As the Ten Commandments contain the whole duty of man, and as in the enumeration here given of the duties that men owe to the powers that be, there is no mention of any of the things contained in the first table of the law. It follows that none of the duties enjoined in the first table of the law of God do men owe to the powers that be, that is to say again, that the powers that be are though ordained of God are not ordained of God in anything pertaining to a single duty enjoined in any one of the first four of the Ten Commandments. 
These are duties that men owe to God, and with those the powers that be can of right have nothing to do, because Christ has commanded to render unto God, not to Caesar, nor by Caesar, that which is God's. Therefore, as in his comment upon the principle which Christ established, Paul has left out of the account the first four commandments. So we deny forever the right of any civil government to legislate in anything that pertains to men's duties to God under the first four commandments. This Sunday bill does propose to legislate in regard to the Lord's day. If it is the Lord's day, we are to render it to the Lord, not to Caesar. When Caesar exacts it of us, he is exacting what does not belong to him and in demanding of us that which he should have nothing to do. Senator Blair, would it answer your objection in that regard if instead of saying the Lord's Day, we should say Sunday? Mr. Jones, no, sir, because the underlining principle, the sole basis of Sunday, is ecclesiastical, and legislation in regard to it is ecclesiastical legislation. I shall come more fully to the question you ask presently. Now, do not misunderstand us on this point. We are Seventh-day Adventists, but if this bill were in favor of enforcing the observance of the seventh day as the Lord's day, we would oppose it just as much as we oppose it as it is now for the reason that civil government has nothing to do with what we owe to God or whether we owe anything or not or whether we pay it or not. Allow me again to refer to the words of Christ to emphasize this point. At that time, the question was upon the subject of tribute, whether it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not. In answering the question, Christ established this principle. Render, therefore, unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. That tribute money was Caesar's. It bore his image and superscription. It was to be rendered to him. Now, it is a question of rendering Sabbath observance, and it is perfectly legitimate and indeed a necessary question to ask right here. Is it lawful to render Lord's Day observance to Caesar? The reply may be in his own words, show me the Lord's Day whose image and superscription does it bear? The Lord's, to be sure. This very bill, which is under discussion here today, declares it to be the Lord's day. Then the words of Christ apply to this. Bearing the image and superscription of the Lord, render therefore to the Lord the things that are the Lord's, and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It does not bear the image and superscription of Caesar. It does not belong to him. It is not to be rendered to him. Again, take the institution under the word Sabbath. Is it lawful to render Sabbath observance to Caesar or not? Show us the Sabbath. Whose image and superscription does it bear? The commandment of God says, it is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It bears his image and superscription and his only. It belongs wholly to him. Caesar can have nothing to do with it. It does not belong to Caesar. Its observance cannot be rendered to Caesar, but only to God. For the commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If it is not kept holy, if it is not kept at all, Therefore, belonging to God, bearing his superscription, and not that of Caesar, according to Christ's commandment, it is to be rendered only to God, because we are to render to God that which is God's. And the Sabbath 
is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Sabbath observance, therefore, or Lord's Day observance, whichever you may choose to call it, never can be rendered to Caesar. And Caesar can never demand it without demanding that which belongs to God or without putting himself in the place of God and usurping the prerogative of God. Therefore, we say that if this bill were firmed in behalf of the real Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day, the day which we observe, if this bill proposed to promote its observance or compel men to do no work upon that day, we would oppose it just as strongly as we oppose it now. And I would stand here at this table and argue precisely as I am arguing against this and upon the same principle, the principle established by Jesus Christ that with that which is God's, the civil government never can of right have anything to do. That duty rests solely between man and God, and if any man does not render it to God, he is responsible only to God, and not to any man, nor to any assembly or organization of men, for his failure or refusal to render it to God or any power that undertakes to punish that man for his failure or refusal to render to God what is God's, puts himself in the place of God. Any government which attempts it sets itself against the word of Christ and is therefore anti-Christian. This Sunday bill proposes to have this government do just that thing. And therefore, I say, without any reflection upon the author of the bill, this National Sunday Bill, which is under discussion here today, is anti-Christian. But in saying this, I am not singling out this contemplated law is worse than all other Sunday laws in the world. There never was a Sunday law that was not anti-Christian. And there can never be that will not be anti-Christian. Senator Blair, you oppose all Sunday laws of the country then? Mr. Jones, yes, sir. Senator Blair, you're against all Sunday laws? Mr. Jones, yes, sir. We are against every Sunday law that was ever made in this world, from the first enacted by Constantine to this one now proposed, and we will be equally against a Sabbath law if it were proposed, for that would be anti-Christian too. Senator Blair, state and national alike? Mr. Jones, state and national, sir, I shall give you historical reasons presently and the facts upon which these things stand, and I hope they will receive consideration. George Washington, I believe, is yet held in, in the same respectful consideration. He is by Seventh-day Adventist, at least, and he said, quote, Every man who conducts himself as a good citizen is accountable alone to God for his religious faith and is to be protected in worshiping God according to the dictates of his own conscience, close quote. And so should we be protected so long as we are law-abiding citizens. There are no saloon keepers among us. We are as a body for prohibition. And as for principles of Christian temperance, we conscientiously practice them. In short, you will find no people in this country or in the world more peaceable and law-abiding than we endeavor to be. We teach the people according to the Scripture to be subject to the powers that be. We teach them that the highest duty of the Christian citizen is strictly to obey the law, to obey it not from fear of punishment, but out of respect for governmental authority and out of respect for God and conscience towards him. Senator Blair, that is the common Mormon argument. The Mormons say their institution is a matter of religious belief. Everybody concedes their right to believe in Mormonism, but when they come to the point of practicing it, will it not be to the disturbance of others? Mr. Jones, 
I should have come to that even though you had not asked the question. But as you have introduced it, I will notice it now. My argument throughout is that the civil government can never have anything to do with men's duties under the first four of the Ten Commandments. And this is the argument embodied in Washington's words. These duties pertain solely to God. Now, polygamy is adultery. But adultery is not a duty that men owe to God in any way, much less does it come under any of the first four commandments. This comes within the inhibitions of the second table of the law, the commandments embracing duty to our neighbor. How men should conduct themselves toward their fellow men, civil government must decide. That is the very purpose of its existence. Consequently, the practice of polygamy lying wholly within this realm is properly subject to the jurisdiction of civil government. My argument does not in the least degree countenance the principles of Mormonism, nor can it fairly be made to do so. I know that it is offered as a very ready objection, but those who offer it as an objection and as an argument against the principles upon which we stand thereby make adultery a religious practice. But against all such objection and argument, I maintain that adultery is not in any sense a religious practice. It is not only highly irreligious, but it is essentially uncivil. And because it is uncivil, the civil power has as much right to blot it out as it is to punish murder or thieving or perjury or any other uncivil thing. Moreover, we deny that honest occupations on any day of the week or at any time whatever can ever properly be classed with adultery. There are also people who believe in a community of property in this world. Suppose they base their principles of having all things in common under the apostolic example. Very good. They have the right to do that. Everyone who sells his property and puts it into a common fund has a right to do that if he chooses. But suppose these men, in carrying out that principle and in claiming that it is a religious ordinance, were to take without consent your property or mine into their community, then what? The state forbids it. It does not forbid the exercise of their religion, but it protects your property and mine. And in exercising its prerogative of protection, it forbids theft. And in forbidding theft, the state never asks any questions as to whether thieving is a religious practice so also as to polygamy, which is practiced among the Mormons. But let us consider this in another view. It is every man's right in this country or anywhere else to worship an idol if he chooses. That idol embodies his conviction of what God is. He can worship only according to his convictions. It matters not what form his idol may have, he has the right to worship it anywhere in all the world, therefore, in the United States. But suppose that in the worship of that God, he attempts to take the life of one of his fellow men and offer it as a human sacrifice. The civil government exists for the protection of life, liberty, property, etc. And it must punish that man for his attempt upon the life of his fellow man. The civil law protects man's life from such exercise of anyone's religion, but in punishing the offender, the state does not consider the question of his religion at all. It would punish him just the same if he made no pretensions to worship or to religion. It punishes him for his incivility, for his attempt at murder, not for his irreligion. I repeat, the question of religion 
is not considered by the state. The sole question is, did he threaten the life of his fellow man? Civil government must protect its citizens. This is strictly within Caesar's jurisdiction. It comes within the line of duties which the scriptures show to pertain to our neighbor and with it Caesar has to do. Therefore, it is true that the state can never of right legislate in regard to any man's religious faith or in relation to anything in the first four commandments of the Decalogue. But if in the exercise of his religious convictions under the first four commandments, a man invades the rights of his neighbor as to life, family, property, or character, then the civil government says that it is unlawful. Why? Because it is irreligious or immoral? Not at all. But because it is uncivil. And for that reason only, it can never be proper for the state to ask any question as to whether any man is religious or not, or whether his actions are religious or not. The sole question must ever be, is the action civil or uncivil? Senator Blair, now apply that right to this case, to the institution of the Sabbath among men for the good of men. Mr. Jones, very good. We will consider that. Here are persons who are keeping Sunday. It is their right to work on every other day of the week. It is their right to work on that day if they desire. But they are keeping that day, recognizing it as the Sabbath. Now, while they are doing that which is their right, here are other people who are keeping Saturday and others who are keeping Friday. The Mohammedans recognize Friday, but we will confine ourselves to those who keep Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath. Those who keep Sunday and who want legislation for that day ask that other people shall be forbidden to work on Sunday because they say it disturbs their rest, it disturbs their worship, etc. And they claim that their rights are not properly protected. Do they really believe that in principle? Let us see. They will never admit, at any rate, I have never yet found one of them who would, that their work on Saturday disturbs the rest or the worship of the man who rests on Saturday. If their work on Saturday does not disturb the Sabbath rest or the worship of the man who keeps Saturday, then upon what principle is it that our work on Sunday disturbs the rest of those who keep Sunday? I have never found one on that side yet who would admit the principle. If their work does not disturb our rest and our worship, our work cannot disturb their rest or their worship. More than this, in a general Sunday convention held in San Francisco, at which I was present, there was a person who spoke on this very question. Said he, there are some people, and a good many of them in this state, who do not believe in Sunday laws and who keep Saturday as the Sabbath. But, said he, the majority must rule. The vast majority of the people do keep Sunday. Their rights must be respected, and they have a right to enact it into law. I arose and said, suppose the Seventh-day people were in the majority, and they should go to the legislator and ask for a law to compel you to keep Saturday out of respect to their rights. Would you consider it right? There was a murmur all over the house. No. Senator Blair, upon what ground did they say no? Mr. Jones, that is what I should like to know. They were not logical. Their answers show that there is no ground in justice nor in right for their claim that the majority should rule in matters of conscience. Senator Blair, that does not follow. At least it does not strike me that it follows. The majority has a right to rule in what pertains to the regulation of society. And if Caesar 
regulates society, then the majority has a right in this country to say what we shall render to Caesar, Mr. Jones. Very good. But the majority has no right to say what we shall render to God, nor has it any right to say that we shall render to Caesar that which is God's. If 999 out of every 1,000 people in the United States kept the seventh day, that is Saturday, and I deemed it my right and made it my choice to keep Sunday, they would have no right to compel me to rest on Saturday, Senator Blair. In other words, you take the ground that for the good of society, irrespective of the religious aspect of the question, society may not require abstinence from labor on Sabbath if it disturbs others, Mr. Jones. As to its disturbing others, I have proved that it does not. The body of your question states my position exactly, Senator Blair. You are logical all the way through that there shall be no Sabbath. This question was passed me to ask, is the speaker also opposed to all laws against blasphemy? Mr. Jones, yes, sir, but not because blasphemy is not wrong, but because civil government cannot define blasphemy nor punish it. Blasphemy pertains to God. It is an offense against him. It is a sin against him. Senator Blair, suppose the practice of it in society at large is hurtful to society. Mr. Jones, that will have to be explained. How is it hurtful to society? Senator Blair, suppose it be hurtful to society in this way. A belief in the existence of God and reverence for the Creator and a cultivation of that sentiment in society is for the good of society, is in fact the basis of all law and restraint. If the Almighty, who knows everything, or is supposed to, and has all the power, has no right to restrain us, it is difficult to see how we can restrain each other. Mr. Jones, he has the right to restrain us. He does restrain us. Senator Blair, to commonly blaspheme and deride and ridicule the Almighty would, of course, have a tendency to bring up the children who are soon to be the state in an absolute disregard of him and his authority. Blasphemy, as I understand it, is that practice which brings the Creator into contempt and ridicule among his creatures, Mr. Jones. What is blasphemy here would not be blasphemy in China and many other countries, Senator Blair. We are not dealing with pagan communities. A regulation that may be appropriate in a pagan community would not answer men in a Christian community. Do you mean that there is no such thing as blasphemy, Mr. Jones? No, I do not mean that, Senator Blair. The Chinaman hardly believes in any god whatever, at least in no god as we do. Taking our god and these Christian institutions of ours, what do you understand blasphemy to be, Mr. Jones? There are many things that the scriptures show to be blasphemy, Senator Blair. The power of the law has undertaken in various states to say that certain things are blasphemy, Mr. Jones, precisely. But if the law proposes to define blasphemy and punish it, why does it not go to the depth of it and define all and punish all? Senator Blair, perhaps it may not go as far as it ought. You say you are opposed to all laws against blasphemy, cursing, and swearing? Mr. Jones, in relation to any one of the first four commandments. Senator Palmer, Suppose that what is defined as blasphemy in the statutes of the several states should detract from the observance of the law and regard for it. Would you regard laws against it as being improper? Mr. Jones, under the principle that the Scripture lays down, no legislation in any way can be proper in regard to the first four commandments. There may be many ways in which it would appear very appropriate for civil government to do this or to do that. But when you have entered upon such legislation, where will you stop? Senator Palmer, abstaining from blasphemy is a part of the education of the youth of the country. Mr. Jones, that is true. 
If youth are properly educated, they will never blaspheme. Senator Palmer, we pass laws for the education of the youth. The question is whether abstention from blasphemy could not be included in the scope of education. Take it on that ground, Mr. Jones. Idolatry, and covetousness is idolatry, is no more than a violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And if the state can forbid the violation of the third commandment and the fourth, why may it not forbid the violation of the first and the second? And in that case, supplant God at once and establish an earthly theocracy. That is the only logical outcome. Senator Blair, covetousness is a state of mind. But when it becomes practiced by stealing, taking from another without consideration, the law interferes. Mr. Jones, certainly. Senator Palmer, there is an infection in blasphemy or in covetousness. For instance, if one covetous man in a neighborhood should infuse the whole neighborhood with covetousness to such an extent that all would become thieves, then covetousness would be a proper subject of legislation. Mr. Jones, never. You forbid the theft, not the covetousness. You cannot invade the condition of mind in which lies the covetousness. Senator Blair, we do not say that we must invade the condition of mind, but society has a right to make regulations because those regulations are essential to the good of society. Society, by a major vote, establishes a regulation, and we have to obey what is settled by the majority. Mr. Jones, how shall it be discovered what is blasphemy, as it is only an offense against God? In the Puritan theocracy of New England, our historian Bancroft says that the highest offense in a catalog of crimes was blasphemy, or what a jury should call blasphemy. Senator Blair. But the law was behind the jury and said that the practice should be punished. If a jury of 12 men said that one had committed the overt act, then it could be punished. It was the majority who made the law, and the jury only found the question of the fact after the law had been violated. The jury did not make the law, this is a question as to making the law. Mr. Jones, it is not wholly a question only of making the law. The question is whether the law is right when it is made. There is a limit to the lawmaking power, and that limit is the line which Jesus Christ has drawn. The government has no right to make any law relating to the things that pertain to God or offenses against God or religion. It has nothing to do with religion. Blasphemy, according to Judge Cooley in his Constitutional Limitations, quote, is purposely using words concerning the Supreme Being, calculated and designed to impair and destroy the reverence, respect, and confidence due to him as the intelligent creator, governor, and judge of the world. A bad motive must exist. There must be a willful, malicious attempt to lessen men's reverence for the deity or for the accepted religion. Close quote. It is seen at a glance that this comes from the old English system of statues regulating offenses against God and religion. That is where this statue is placed in every system of civil law. It could not be placed anywhere else. But offenses against God are to be answered for only at his tribunal. And with religion or offenses against it, the civil power has nothing to do. It is a perversion of the functions of civil government to have it made a party to religious controversies. It will have ample exercise for its power in jurisdiction to keep religious disputants as well as other people civil without allowing itself ever to become a partisan in religious disputes and the conservator of religious dogmas. But according to Judge Cooley's definition, blasphemy is an attempt to lessen men's reference 
not only for the deity, but for the accepted religion as well. But any man in this wide world has the right to lessen man's reference for the accepted religion if he thinks that religion to be wrong. Consequently, as I said a moment ago, that which would be counted blasphemy here would not be counted blasphemy in China. And that which is in the strictest accordance with the word of God and the faith of Jesus Christ here is necessarily blasphemy in China or in Turkey or in Russia. A man who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ in China commits blasphemy under this definition. He does make a willful attempt to lessen men's reverence for their accepted religion and for the deities recognized in their religion. He had to do so if he is ever to get them to believe in Christ and the religion of Christ. He has to bring them to the place where they will have no reverence for their deities or for their accepted religion before they can accept the religion of Jesus Christ. It is the same way in Turkey or any other Mohammedan country or any heathen country. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, In any Mohammedan or heathen country, it is blasphemy under this definition because its sole object is not only to lessen men's reverence for their deities and for their accepted religion, but to turn them wholly from it, and if possible, to obliterate it from their minds. It is so likewise in Russia. Anybody there who speaks against the accepted religion or against the saints or their images is subject to the penalty of blasphemy, which is banishment for life to Siberia. But if blasphemy be a proper subject of legislation by civil government, if it be right for a government to make itself the defender of the faith, then it is perfectly proper for the laws of China to prohibit under whatever penalty it pleases, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ within the Chinese dominions, because its effect is to lessen men's reverence for the deities recognized by China and for the accepted religion of the country. It is the same way in any of the other countries named. And in that case, there is no such thing as persecution on account of religion. The only persecutions that ever been were because of men speaking against the accepted religion. If this principle be correct, then the Roman Empire did perfectly right in prohibiting under penalty of death the preaching of the religion of Jesus Christ. Whenever Paul or any of his brethren spoke in the Roman Empire, they blasphemed according to the Roman law. They were held as blasphemers and were put to death under the very principle of this definition, which is the principle of the American statues on the subject of blasphemy. The Christian had to tell the Roman Empire that the Roman gods were no gods. They had to tell the Roman Empire that the genius of Rome itself, which the Roman system held to be the supreme deity, was not such, but that it was subordinate and that there was a higher idea of God and of right than the Roman Empire or the Roman law knew anything of. They did speak deliberately against the chief deity of Rome and all the gods of Rome. They did it with the express purpose of destroying reverence for them and for the accepted religion. Rome put them to death. And I repeat, If the principle of the American statues against blasphemy is correct, then Rome did right. To make this clear, I quote a passage from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in defense of this principle in a decision upon this very subject, which says, quote, to prohibit the open, public, and explicit denial of the popular religion of a country is a necessary measure to preserve the tranquility of a government, close quote. That is precisely what the Roman Empire did. Christianity did openly, publicly, and explicitly deny the popular religion of the country. It did it with the intent to destroy men's reverence for the deities and the religion of that country. Rome prohibited it. And upon the principle of the decision of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, 
which is the principle of American law on blasphemy, Rome did right, and Christianity was a blaspheming religion. The principle of this decision seems to be that those who represent the popular religion of a country have so little of the real virtue of the religion which they profess that if anybody speaks against it, it is sure to rouse their combativeness to such a degree as to endanger the public tranquility. Therefore, in order to keep civil those who represent the popular religion, the state must forbid anybody to deny that religion. This decision of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is one of the grand precedents that have been followed in all the later decisions upon this subject in the younger states. But this decision itself followed one by Chief Justice Kent of the Supreme Court of New York in 1811, in which embodies the same principle. It defends the right of the state to punish such offenses against what he calls a Christian people, and not equally to punish like offenses against the religion of the other people in this country by the following argument, quote, nor are we bound by any expressions in the Constitution, as some have strangely supposed, either not to punish at all or to punish indiscriminately the like attacks upon the religion of Muhammad or of the Grand Lama, and for this plain reason that the case assumes that we are a Christian people, and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity and not upon the doctrines or worship of those impostors. Close quote. This is only to argue that if the morality of the country were engrafted upon the religion of Muhammad or the Grand Lama, and Christians were to speak against and deny that accepted religion, it would be proper that the state should punish those Christians for so doing. If that principle be correct, then a Mohammedan country has the right to prohibit the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ within its limits. According to these decisions, Luther and the reformers of his day were blasphemers. The penalty was death in many cases at the stake, yet under this principle, the state did right to put them to death in whatever way the law prescribed because they did certainly make an open, public, and explicit denial of the popular religion of every country in which they lived and of all Europe. And if the words of Luther were used today in any Catholic country, they would be counted as blasphemous, as a willful and malicious reviling of the accepted religion. The Reformers did hold up to ridicule and contempt the popular religion of all Europe. They did right too, and when the state punished them, it was but carrying out the principles upheld by Chancellor Kent and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and all the other states that have legislated on the subject of religion. As I have already stated, it was upon this principle precisely that the Roman Empire forbade the preaching of the gospel of Christ. It only forbade an open, public, and explicit denial of the popular religion of the country, yet in forbidding that, it forbade the preaching of the gospel of Christ. But Christ sent forth his disciples to preach the gospel to every creature, and they did it in the face of the Roman law and in opposition to the whole power of the Roman Empire. And everybody in all the world has an undeniable right to make an open, public, and explicit denial of the popular religion of this country or any other if he thinks that religion to be wrong. The principle of these decisions and of the civil statutes against blasphemy is essentially a pagan principle, and not a Christian principle. It is peculiarly appropriate, therefore, that Chief Justice Kent not only cited the precedences of the church and state principles of the colonies and of the British government, but appealed to the pagan governments of antiquity and the papal institutions of modern Europe as the basis 
of his decision. It is true that all these nations have set themselves up as the special guardians of their deities and have prohibited the denial of the popular religion. And it is equally true that all these nations have resisted every step in enlightenment and progress that has ever been made in the march of time. Every step forward in religion and in the enlightenment has of necessity been taken in the face of all the opposition which these states and empires could bring to bear. But the principles of American institutions are neither pagan nor papal. The principles of the American Constitution, which forbids legislation on the subject of religion, are Christian principles. And it is strictly an order for Supreme Courts in making decisions in behalf of what they boast of as the Christian religion to base their decision upon something else than the course of pagan governments of antiquity and the papal institutions of modern Europe. Upon such a subject, it would seem to be proper for them to refer to the teachings and principles of the author of Christianity. But singularly enough, it has never been done, and doubtless for the very good reason that it never can be done, for the teachings of Jesus Christ are directly against it. His word forbids civil government to have anything to do with what pertains to God. And instead of teaching his disciples to prosecute, to fine, and to punish by civil law those who speak against them or their religion, he says, Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. How can men be brought to respect God or Jesus Christ by civil penalties upon their bodies and goods? How can they respect the religion of men who are ready to prosecute and imprison them? Every principle of the thing is contrary, both to the spirit and the letter of Christianity. The religion of Jesus Christ properly exemplified in the daily lives of those who profess it is the best argument and the strongest defense against blasphemy, both as defined by the scriptures and by the civil statutes. Laws, therefore, prohibiting what a jury may call blasphemy, are pagan and not Christian. The decisions of the Supreme Courts of New York and Pennsylvania upon this subject are pagan decisions and not Christian. They are based upon pagan precedents, not Christian. The deadly persecutions of all history, pagan, papal, and so-called Protestant, are justified in these decisions. Michael Servertus was burnt for blasphemy, the only use that it has ever been or ever is made of any such laws in any country is to give some religious bigots who profess the popular religion an opportunity to vent their wrath upon persons who disagree with them. Any man who really possesses the religion of Christ will have enough of the grace of God to keep him from endangering the public tranquility when his religion is spoken against. Therefore, I say that we are opposed to all laws of civil government against blasphemy, not because blasphemy is not wrong, but because it is a wrong of that kind with which civil government has nothing to do. And in this, we stand wholly upon Christian principle. We stand exactly where the early Christians stood. For I say again, when Paul spoke in the Roman Empire, he was blaspheming according to the law, was held as a blasphemer and an atheist, and was put to death as such, under the very principle upon which the American laws of blasphemy are sustained.